Alright. Yeah, Soundgarden, Bad Motor Finger, the story behind every song. Part two. Um so yeah, let's just go. Plays and bulldozers. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. h- how did that song start who wrote that face pollution where did it where did it come from i wrote it in a freezing cold uh cabin that i was living in at the time and i would borrowed kim's guitar and then i brought in the four track cassette tape to face pollution uh-huh. right yeah yeah and i remember terry date listening to it at a vast because we were all listening like hey ben's got this song and right. terry goes it sounds like breakfast because it was because <laughs> it was all sizzly, just totally distorted, totally way amped in the red. And I actually I don't even know what I called it back then, but and you guys liked it, and I was like, wow, that was the first time I got my four track to work and pan, you know, I'm like whoa, I can put other parts here and make it do this and that. <laughs> and then my friend Ernest played trumpet on it. Yeah. yeah. Because that guitar part that Kim was talking about, the double E thing earlier, drop down to B or whatever. Right. Yeah. That was supposed to be a trumpet or emulating a trumpet, which is emulating a siren. You know, and that's, right. that's why I tune it that way. So that's, you know, it made sense to have Ernest put the yep. trumpet on there. And that was a hard song to play. Well, is that, is that break section is just insane. It's the... Zappa-esque section. Yeah, that, I love that. I mean, to this... I thought it was a lot more visceral than, like, like proggy. It has you know, that, and it, then also... I, it's totally <laughs> wrong. I'm totally like, whoa, this doodle is way completely well, it has different. Well, it has this visceral hardcore element, then it has this crazy proggy melody. It's it's in the middle. It's it's not really proggy, like, overdone yeah, or I know. Yeah. over... I don't you know, even know Theatrical or operatic. It. It's... But it's definitely spasmo. Yeah, it's just yeah. It's just it's it's wonderful. It's 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 besides slaves and bulldozers. I think we should, that's, we should that's rewrite that's a it. Standout section. <laughs> I think. Of course you do. I should take the breakfast out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I I think you had vision in writing it, and you did exactly what you wanted to do, and it all and the execution was really great. As a matter of fact, I think that the guitar overdub part that I came up with was. Partly echoing the trumpet part, the banap banap bow. Yep. It's a so, legato riff off that trumpet line. So you did that trumpet line. So I kind of did like a two string, mm-hmm. sort of like this. Kind of, it's kind of like little, little suspended thing. Yeah, you know, exactly. That Stones chord sort of thing. It's, it's like adds a perfect bow, legato bow. to it. It's, it's a, that other riff. It's like a backward on. one four five. It's like well, like a E D A or something like that, or D C G. It's one of those two things. So you mean that triangle look? Yeah. Or the... Like a right angle? Or a sail? Yeah. yeah. Like a corner of a yeah. s- where the ceiling meets the wall. Right angle. It was that part. You always have these good right angles to throw in. It is if I play it correctly, otherwise it isn't right. Let's put this right angle on that breakfast and have it slow down right there. <laughs> That's what makes it sound like breakfast. It sounds yeah, like coffee cut, to go on cuts, a sunny yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. Cuts it. It's got that it's, crunch of the yeah. cereal. It's like early breakfast when you're seven or nine. It's not like a, <laughs> yeah. it's not it's not a grown up breakfast. It's not, yeah, you're it's right. not exactly. brunch. It's, not, it's, yeah. a bre- it's, it's a, not brunch. It's not Sunday breakfast. It's like yeah, it's gotta go to school soon. But it is kind yeah, of the breakfast exactly. into one warm spot where the sun comes in by the T V set. Yes. Somewhere was a silly tune. I think I just wrote off a the same session as the Freezing cold. No, I moved to a different house by then. I um, was renting a different house. I mean, and it's, I think, the first bizarre tuning that I brought in. Yeah. It's got some really precise parts that are kind of quirky and proggy, but we get away with playing it kind of loose and free, even though the parts are kind of. Precise. When we play it live now, it reminds me of playing like a Joy Division type thing, but really sloggy drunk or something instead of yeah. uptight and analytical yeah. you know it's really it's, it's not it's not happy it's not fastidious or yeah. ordered it's but it's but it is organized but it's it seems really stable now to me you know it seems um, like that spasmo stuff earlier to me when we first did it when i first brought it in i thought it was way more spasmo and kind of weak especially lyrically it's just really dumb Trying to write words, you know, like whatever. 
Now the words are cool. But now it's all, it seems the way we play it live now seems really stable to me. And it's way more psychedelic than it. Yes, definitely. That's what's weird. Because I was trying weird. to make psychedelia with punk rock, and that's what I was into back then, trying to make things psychedelic and punk rock at the same time. There was also something very hooky about that song. Yeah. Like, I always thought it, it should have been, or could have been a single. Um, and and Definitely. I also remember the beginning, because on the demo, um, the way, Ben, that you sang the, the intro, I could never really do it, and I was always kind of dis disappointed with the fact that I couldn't do that as well. Um, but I felt like the overall... That's very interesting to hear Chris say you can't do something. It, it was super unique, but it, but it also had a kind of hooky quality to it. Like in a, in like a, like if you took some sort of a psychedelic pop song and completely fucked it up and put it on its ear. Well, good, then it worked. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is pretty amazing that like the way Ben characterizes being sort of spazzy and, or I might say it's kind of has these sort of organized quirky parts. The fact that something loose like psychedelia can be extracted out of that is, is it's something I like about what we do, or and the yeah. fact that we we're able to do it. Certainly on a lot of these songs, but yeah, like you can look certainly. at it at a certain angle, and then you tilt it a little bit different. There's a way different angle depth going on underneath there. Yeah, like uh, I think it's in the third verse. Do 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 yeah. do. That overdub you that's, did. That's piano. way in there. Yeah, there's a bass and piano. Yeah, on it. it changes like that. how the sunlight hits the water. And, you know, the refraction. It's, it's a different. little cinematic part there. Searching, uh, that's another B drop B song. It started out that way. We don't do it oh, that way now. Right. Yeah, now we... Yep. Right, it's, it is recorded in drop B, but we rearranged it for D. Yeah, live, but right? but live. but we still play the intro the same. So the <laughs> what what I liked about it, what originally made me kind of want to make a song out of it was I was doing that drone as an intro, um, and I'd had the song in drop B for whatever else I was doing, probably Rusty Cage, um, and then when I went to play the the riff, it was in drop B and it just ratcheted it down to that key. And and it was really kind of an unexpected feeling, and it felt super heavy. And um, oh, yeah. it, I'm yeah. singing it lower, and it probably wasn't my best range. Like I think it's better for me uh, as a singer to sing it a little bit higher. But I really liked it. It was there was something really trippy about it. Um, and and I think there was something in that world of kind of. Uh, indie psychedelia that was still sort of heavy that that we could do well um but that was droney that kind of reminded me a little of spaceman 3 or something but but more like us riff oriented heavy there was some, you know some kind of a weight to it and less um self-indulgent in a way again that's another one of our songs uh, i'm sorry it definitely has these distinct sections you know like the right. main riff is definitely has this, you know, three or four note heavy, you know, sort of a that weird minor third sort of groove thing. Then it's got the Eastern, the Indian sort of riff and a and that Beatles, the sort of Beatlesy part, you know, the with the hammer ons yeah. and hammer offset. And then uh -huh. it ends with this like right. total two chord Stooges riff and like like it's something off of, <laughs> with this fun house sort of like just jam out. And it begins with that Spaceman three sort of thing, but it's. It's like this. It, it's a, it, it's just pretty cool how all those oh, different elements wise. work together. It's and it's hilarious. <laughs> That's what it starts out hilarious, and then all of a sudden it gets to be this trippy, dark, heavy thing. <laughs> I, I remember us just being in stitches. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The the whole the whole. Scene. This is such a musician. Like just everything about it is such like a musician sense of humor. A musician's take on things like yeah this is funny Ian say bit at the <laughs> beginning is just it's just classic chris do you remember on that we all had a cassette tape of each yeah. of our guys songs that we brought in you brought in a whole bunch of songs and that's on there do you how did mm -hmm. that start 
before we. It is the actual C and say, isn't it? Am I remembering? Well, that? I I got the idea because somebody, my roommate, I think at some point he had it's a, a broken C and say or something. Yeah, and we pulled on the string. You know, it was like it was like this is a cow, and then it went, this is a pig, and then we're going oink oink oink, and then we pulled on it and it went this is, a... and, the, and the voice slowed down, and then whatever the animal sound was was like <laughs> perfect, and I, and I said it out loud like and the devil says, and, yeah. and I thought oh that'd be a really cool that'd be a cool song intro for that. All right, Room. But I remember driving around Green Lake and Kim was talking about the lyrics of Room. Tomorrow yeah, begets Kim, tomorrow Kim, begets tomorrow. That's right? a line. Or begot tomorrow. I can't yeah, remember. Be, tomorrow begat. 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 That's, a, that's actually borrowed from a, um, a conversation that I had with Steve Fisk and he's describing some play or novel or short story and in it there's some witches and some point, this is a statement the witches That's one of their are chanting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. While they're and they're saying tomorrow beget, tomorrow beget, tomorrow beget, tomorrow just repetent. So that was the uh, maybe the first time that I remember that you kind of hummed the lyrics to me. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I'd have to show you the lyrics and then just kind of hum. We play the 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 music. When I heard that music, Matt from Matt's demo, I just I fell in love with it. There are things about it that reminded me of like remind me of the Young Gods uh, and some other stuff I really liked. You know, like um, some Killing Joke, yeah, public public yeah. image. It may specifically have been it may have remind me of this Young Gods song called CSCDLF, and it's all I. Th I don't think it's I sung just in always English. called it Angry Eno because I didn't have the knowledge of the young gods yet. <laughs> but anyways, so I just loved that riff and I thought, hey, I can wind some lyrics around this. So I'd have to listen to the listen to the I think I think we're probably at a vast and Stuart would play the music and then I'd have to just kind of hum the melody part to Chris over the over the main groove. And then he would he would kind of see how I'm winding it around mm -hmm. the riff, and then he'd go and then take the lyrics and create the emphasis and inflection that would work rhythmically with the with the song. And but you like, kind of had it. I mean, rhythmically, you were pretty much giving it to me. And the, and I think if the, if I took license, it was a little bit of the melody. Um, but when you sang it to me, it it was. I, I feel like rhythmically pretty much what it is. I think I had the time signature thing down, but I think you kind of got the punctuation once you do the phrasing and all that. I'm like, I'm oh, Yeah, I might have just forgot what you showed me. <laughs> <laughs> I forget what I do myself. But the yeah, I, I, I remember that moment. And the other thing I remember is, and, and it may still be true, is that the original lyrics that you wrote down, I put in my, uh, in my guitar, which is the rock jet that... Gary Lee Connor bought me, and it's still in there. Gary from the Screaming Trees. So the yes. lyrics are still in that guitar case? Uh-huh. Wow. I never took them out because I, once I realized, oh, God, this is old, I thought, if I take it out, it'll, I'll never see it again. Yeah. So it's still there. <laughs> awesome. So what's this story about Mind Riot, Chris? I don't know, Kim. It's a conversation you were having with Jeff Ament, right? Of Mother uh -huh. of Bone and now, of course, Pearl Jam. And didn't uh -huh. he make a comment about, wouldn't it be crazy to have a, a guitar where every string is tuned to E and to try to write a song that way? <laughs> so and Chris thought, did. yeah. <laughs> and so he, Chris went it. and tuned a guitar with every string to E and no, wrote a song. I remember song. that Chris had already done that. And then yeah, I think the commenting on it and he's like, hmm, that's cool. That's cool, Jeff. I think yeah, I've actually already done that. <laughs> From what? Oh wow! From the way I remember it, Chris was telling me like he took it as a Excuse challenge. That when Jeff said that'd be to no, do that, I think, was, I think it was more awkwardly funny. If that. only we could ask Chris. <laughs> yeah, where is Chris anyway? I think the, I think the my memory of it was something to the degree of like us sort of not realizing that each 
each other had done something. And he was making fun of, of doing something as <laughs> yeah. dumb as tuning all the strings to E. And, and the... I said something to the effect of, what kind of idiot would play an eight-string bass? And I and <laughs> um, immediately looked and, like, I think I saw one but, and, and was no. super embarrassed by it. Well, that's perfect. Good. I usually look on the perfect. one who puts my foot. <laughs> <laughs> I remember having a weird time playing, learning that song. Yeah. It was and like it, the last it, one I'd learned. It's like, it kind of, kind of seemed kind of ballady and had a weird tuning. It's like, how do... What, and there's like this weird hammer off somewhere in the middle of the song, and I was like, "How does that happen?" Um, the intro is a hammer uh, is like a weird double hammer on thing, yeah. and then there's a hammer off thing that's weird because and, and it's like three strings. Um, yeah, that was throwing me off and on. And uh, also, the the no guitar likes that tuning. So if you listen to the to our version, it's a little out of tune. And um, it never worked for us to play it together live because my guitar would never be in tune with yeah, yours. Right. That's you know, why we, I think that's the song that had the single string thing done to it, so you could get the actual exact. Tune. Yeah, because there was a, there were a couple overdubs, and there might have been. I don't remember tracking that one at all. I think we can nail that now. I mean, now when I hear the song, it's like, oh yeah. I mean, it's like I have a mental picture of it. It's and, pretty simple, really. Yeah. It is. Back then, it just seemed a little bit out of the blue to try to tackle it, especially after doing all these heavy riffs. And and this one was a, a certainly a different approach. It wasn't um, didn't have that kind of line that just kind of blew up and went all over the place. Drawing flies, roaring. Well, we referred Drawing to that flies. earlier when we. Hold on, I'm gonna stop there. We'll come back and I'll put them both together. Um, yeah, definitely been interesting because our degree who tunes every string to E and makes it to make anything off of it. Let alone a song. How do you make? <clears throat> hmm. How do you even tune every string to E? The tension on that neck must have been ridiculous. But anyway, yeah, I'll come back with the second half in a minute. Um, yeah, that's the reaction. Kind of. Back in a sec. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, finishing this off. Coming in, baby. Coming in. Right, yeah, let's go. Talked about the sax playing by Scott Granlin. Matt writing the song, music. Uh huh. So it's off the same demo tapes as uh, Room. Yeah, it, was, any... it always reminded me of Angry Eno somehow, like something that would be off of um, the record with King's Lead Hat on it, but a way more gnarly cartoon version of it. You know, like like Chris's lyrics with X's drawn on your eyes and stuff. It's way more fun, right. Than serious like scientist type stuff remember trying to do the the riff on that scientist too type stuff. yes it was, it was nerve-wracking because it did it that really finicky little half step that you have to do just right yeah and i was all worried when we were tracking <laughs> i mean matt wrote room the music for room but that was very guitar like but drawing yeah. flies he has these drummer sensibilities and he's you know He's a ace drummer, so having to try to read whatever it is he's hearing and and put it, and play guitar in a way that I wouldn't naturally well, yeah, the, play it. The drummer vertical guitar yes. drumming or guitar playing, drummer playing guitar vertically <laughs> on beat. That, that, that's really staccato. Yeah. Really, and then really trying try to get his out. his sense about that is it's a tough thing. But Matt's pretty, you know. He's a he, he's a he's a patient he's a patient uh, school teacher in that regard. Yeah, he might let the other kids go out you to guys recess. Always and nail everything right away, man. I don't. I, no, it takes me. Both it, you guys, you just go. It depends on on just how hungry oh, I am. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this. 
I remember and appreciating Chris taking the time to show me Rusty Cage out on that stage that you were talking about. And I was insane on that ending thing. And that call and response patients, intro, I like, still, yep, still get just weird. totally took the time. Like, no, it's like this, man. Don't worry. Like, <laughs> that's how Matt shows us guitar stuff. Yeah. It's like, yeah. no, you got it. <laughs> Gently. Holy water. Uh, the, uh, the third drop B song. and But I don't know if it was the third one. Um, that I wrote it might have been the first one uh, I just remember the uh, again kind of like Rusty Cage the the fact that I could make these great cool sounding triad chords with the drop B yep. where where it was easy positions and it sounded unlike anything I'd heard um, and it was sort of easy to write to for that moment you know I, I think as time went on it was more difficult because it's only three notes and it, it would all sort of sound like something I'd already done but it, um, it felt unique at the time and it, and, and it was kind of inspiring and that it, there's a big riff but it's also there's a lot of chord changes and, and um, all around three note chords yeah I was like the timber of your voice on that one yeah it was sort of warmer that? and yep. deeper there, it had that one part it had that part that stylistically finger wise kind of was reminiscent of the Beatles part in um, Searching With My Good Eye Closed yes that part that was like little 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 and well you know that I, it, it comes in somewhere there but there's something I love about that song is the tag at the end is such a to me guitar wise it's such a strong riff that it seems like it could have could have built a song yeah, exactly. around that on its own but it's just there's something sort of measured and restrained about just letting it be this tag at the end and and not necessarily expanding it this gives us weight to that song mm -hmm. by the and way it's a perfect segue into new damage too when you think about it going from like what you're yeah. just describing as the it could have be its own song or building to a new song and then all of a sudden Hold there's up. the the sun down it's got a very it's got a very bluesy sort of mm -hmm. sort of a slinky bar like feel to it and then at the end is this entirely different thing it's it, it's heavy and it's you know it's it's a Closing irregular a rhythm book. boom you yeah know? So new damage. What what's the origin of that? Because that I don't remember. It's a DG DG tuning, the digga digga, digga that we'd call it. Yeah, I, I remember the song, but like the where did the where did the main riff come from? Um, you know I can't remember when I came up with that, but I think this playing in that tuning there there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, one you, there's a lot of chords you can make just by fingering one string and letting the other another the other two or three kind of ring out or playing little two string chords and because you have these sets of fifths oh, cool. you also have an easy octave like you have in the drop D you have the right. easy octave of a drop D but you get now you can move it up you know uh, you can move everything up a string and and be able to do that power fifth on the A on the, what would normally be the A D and G strings so uh it's a lot of a lot of because the octaves are all kind of nicely knit like that. You can make a lot of cool open droney things. And I think it was a screw around with that, and then came up with that riff somehow and built stuff around there. Then Matt came up with that little bridge, that little da da da. But when you were messing around with that part, right. yeah. What time was that around? Loud love or was it? Like when you're on tour on Loud Love, or when we got remember. when you guys yeah. got home. I, I think I was probably I was probably playing. I think I was probably playing with it at at, at home or something. It was probably my favorite to sing of the whole record. Similar to Super Unknown, you know, that kind of that's cool, building those Chris. kind of two chord drone things. I always felt sort of open and free with it as as. Uh, yeah, it does have kind of singing some of that performance timing vocally, definitely. Yeah, you wrote the lyrics to "New Damage," right? Yeah, 
Yeah, because I could never read the credits or the lyrics on the album because I'm too... I get bored too easily because I'm a boring guy. <laughs> so everything was jam-packed. Remember how it was written out so it didn't stop? There was no diction to it, like speed freak writing or something? Um, so there's no there, there's no separation from yeah. from one song there's to a, another lyrically? Yeah, yeah, there's a dot and then the name of the title of the song and then the dot and then all the lyrics just nonstop. Da, 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 you know. I think yeah. there are triangles in between each there line. Triangles? But they weren't stacked. Not very specific. They weren't, they they were they small. weren't stacked. <laughs> They were stacked vertically. Remember, they're, they're Chris all used to live in West you. Seattle yeah. back then, and you'd ride sometimes up to Bear Creek on your bike. Yeah, I rode a mountain. I, I ruined my knees riding a mountain bike. Is to that Bear when you were writing the lyrics for that song, though? Or the, like, how do you do that? Like, yeah, when, how do you ride from when, West Seattle when, up no, to Bear No, when were Creek? you coming up with melodies and stuff? Because like I don't remember. 20 some odd miles. I don't remember if new damage was done. In pre-production yet. I don't think so. I think it was finished kind of like Bear Creek or something. I think that- melodies came kind of, uh, they would come pretty quickly after I would hear an arrangement or a riff or whatever. But a lot of the lyrics, probably 75 or 80% of the lyrics for that album I wrote, um... At Clay Lock on the is that's the is that the Washington coast or the Oregon coast? I think Washington, Oregon, Washington. Yeah, I think so. And I went to, I went to a little cabin. Um, I, w- I rented a little cabin there and wrote everything sort of you know kind of finally in ten days and came back and the drive back I had my grandfather's car which was the '66 Chrysler. And I and I was in a really good mood because I felt like the album was going to be great. Turned on the radio, um, and they were announcing that that Desert Shield was turning into Desert Storm, and I just thought that's it. It's we're screwed. I I remember it feeling like uh, it it was the album that I felt like we were trying to make. Um, maybe during the two previous albums, in a way, and in, in, in a sense, it was kind of like we had sort of finally made the album that we had been trying to make. And not to take anything away from uh, Ultra Mega OK or Louder Than Love, but I felt like um, song-wise, arrangement-wise, sonically, um, with you and the band, Ben, contributing something that was completely different, it all seemed to kind of come together, and and uh, suddenly we kind of made this defining album. Mm. Yeah, I get that. Uh, yeah, not disrespecting the others, but the other ones was winding that sound that they found on that album. Because that album is just a banger, one after the other. I haven't done, I've done songs off of the other albums that you mentioned, but not done the whole album. Um, so maybe that might be at some point to go through and compare it to that, now that Chris has kind of said it. But... Um, Puppy's fighting my punch bag over there. <coughs> Nala. But yeah. Um, the amount of... That must, makes it so complicated. I've never been a guitar player that's liked um, changing the tuning all that much. But yeah. It's so... Cause that must have made their early shows so complicated. Especially when you're like... I don't know whether they did it on the first album, but especially when you're starting out, because you've only, like, typically only got one guitar anyway, and to keep having to retune it, you need to be a rock star to be able to have a tour bus for the cars. Guitar. <laughs> to um, have a, yeah, a roadie hand them off to you each different track, and so you're tuned in to them. It makes things so complicated. Um, and yeah, I'd never, that was always too finicky for me. But yeah, that was good now. But also, there's just their sense of humor. One sounds like breakfast, and you're like, what? And then you get what he means, the sizzle of bacon, or... And it's just so, like, goofy sense of, it's a musician's humor. Um, it's a bit like The Simpsons, isn't it? The B-sharps. And they always, when Homer's in a band, and it's the, yeah, the B-sharps. Um, which is obviously, there isn't a B-sharp. 
<laughs> but obviously it's the, the double meaning of B's sharp sting and B sharp. But it's a very musician's joke. Um, yeah, because there is no B sharp on the scale. It goes B, C. So, um, what does it? Yeah, and then C, D, isn't it? Yeah. B, A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp. Is that right? Maybe there is B sharp actually now I'm thinking of it. No, there's not that. No. Because yeah, you got B flat, B, C, yeah. And then baby. You wanna play, alright. But yeah, that's the reaction. Sweet.